Bill's going to catch the shell of the egg that England laid. Yes, sir, so we can tell, tell, tell on this humid Monday morning in this congressional incubator. And just as Tom here has written, though the shell may belong to Great Britain, the eagle inside belongs to us. And just as Tom here has written, we say to hell with Great Britain, the eagle inside belongs to us. Sit down, John. Sit down, John. For God's sake, John. Sit down. Sit down, John. Sit down. Sit down. Soon as you can to my cloister, I've forgotten the feel of your hand. Soon, madam, we shall walk in Cupid's Grove together, and we'll fondly survey that promised land. You see it barely, barely, everywhere eerily, barely. Everywhere I leave. Look out! It's Arthur Lee, Bobby Lee, General Light Horse Harry Lee, Jesse Lee, Willie Lee, and Richard H. That's me. Mr. Adams. Damn you, Mr. Adams. You're obnoxious and disliked. That cannot be denied. Once again, you stand between me and my lovely bride. bride. Oh, Mr. Adams, you are driving me to homicide. 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 He plays the violin. He tucks it right under his chin and he bows oh he bows for oh, he knows yes he knows that it's high 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 diddle diddle breaks my heart tom and his fiddle i sing hosanna hosanna in a sane and lucid manner we are cool we're the cool cool considerate men whose life may never ever be seen again we are land cash in hand self-command future plan my eyes are wide open my face to the sky is that you I'm hearing in the tall grass nearby? Mama, come find me before I do die. Molasses, drum, to slaves. Who sails the ships back to Boston? with gold see it gleam whose fortunes are made in the triangle trade hail slavery the new England dream is anybody there does anybody care Anybody see what I see? I see fireworks. I see the pageant and pomp and parade. I hear the bells ringing out. I hear the cannons roar. I see Americans, all Americans free And we're live.
Hi, everybody. Mike Isaacson, the artistic director and executive producer of the Muni, welcoming you to one of our Monday night cast parties. Uh, as you may have guessed, tonight we are gathering uh, cast members from last season's production of 1776, which I have to do a caveat right up front. It was an extraordinarily huge cast. Uh, I think we had like 27 principals in it, uh, representing all of those colonies. So unfortunately we don't have everybody uh, joining us tonight because we can only do boxes of six, uh, but uh, we're gonna have a lot of fun and we're seeing that some, uh, some of our cast members are also joining us on the side, including our, uh, let's see, our stage manager, Nancy Uffner, and all kinds of, there she is, hi Nance, uh, all kinds of fun people. So to review, uh, 1776 ran from June 27th through July 3rd. Uh, one of the things we'll talk about is that final show on July 3rd had a rain delay where we ended almost at midnight signing the Declaration of Independence. Uh, it was directed by Rob Ruggiero with choreography by Enrique Brown, set scenic design by Luke Cantrella, costumes Alejo Vietti, lighting designer John Lasseter, sound John Shivers, David Patridge, video Greg Amitaz, wig Leo Lucas, and our production stage manager was Nancy Uffner. Um, I can tell you from my experience and perspective, this was uh, just a joy to work on and it was just an exciting challenge for all of us at the Muni because if you know anything about 1776, it's a play with music. Um, and it also historically contains the longest book scene, meaning the longest scene where there's no song in any musical. I think it's like uh, 30 minutes or so. Uh, which was, quote, I've already been corrected by the director who's gonna join us later, Rob Ruggiero, 45 minutes. Uh, all right, so to begin, let's bring on our uh, triumphant triangle. We've got Robert Petkoff, who played John Adams, Hello. Adam Heller, who was Ben Franklin, and Keith Hines, who was Thomas Jefferson. Hello. Hello. And How are you? Oh, it's good to see you. To Adam, see you. what an impressive apartment. <laughs> Do, do, are you appreciating the balance here? The symmetry. I feel like, I feel like that's a Zoom backdrop or something. <laughs> it's the real thing. You know, if I can't, I have to achieve balance somewhere these days. <laughs> that's right. Yeah. Why not? Be Good to see you guys. Hi, pal. Very quickly, I'll cut off. Tell us where you are and how you're doing. Robert, where are you? Uh, I'm in Manhattan, uh, Upper West Side, and have been here since the beginning of the whole thing uh, at the Epicenter. Um, but we've been, my wife and I have been very good about staying home and, and only going out when we need to go, uh, trying to flatten that curve. Um, and, uh, and I've been very lucky because I, I, in the midst of all of this theater being canceled, I also uh, narrate audiobooks, And I've been able to set up a, a makeshift studio in my bathroom and have been spending seven hours a day in my bathroom uh, <laughs> for weeks on end uh, recording books and trying to earn a little money. So I've been lucky. Adam, how and where are you? Fantastic. Uh, I, I am in Midtown Manhattan. Uh, Beth Level is in the next room. Uh, she and I are doing quite well. So, uh, you know, bearing up well in a very strange city. <laughs> and Keith, where are you? I left the city. Uh, Jenna and I, my fiance Jenna, have an apartment in Astoria. We decided to come out to her parents' house on Long Island, and we're very well kept here, very safe. I keep saying, my future mother-in-law cooks so well, I could do this till 2024 if need be. <laughs> <laughs> really lucky. <You're> crazy. <laughs> <laughs> How's St. Louis? Uh, St. Louis is doing uh, well. We have essentially flattened our curve. Excellent. And, uh, Great. Today was the first day where this city and the county made its first steps towards opening under Great. limited circumstances. So we'll see how that works out. Um, so that's where we're at. So let's talk about 1776. All right. I'm going to start with you, Robert, because you every night you did something absolutely amazing where I, there wasn't really an overture, or I guess there was an overture, or there was that fife and drum thing that we started put in. But you had to walk out in front of 10,000 people and literally talk to them and just start the show. Like, yeah. Was, yeah, just like, here we go. And I was always just in awe of every night, like they were with you, like by your third line. So 
What was that like for you? Like, was that terrifying? Well, you know, what was what really great was, of course, if those who, who saw it and remember, the show began with the set spinning around uh, and the set would get such a great response every night that in that moment, I think all the actors on stage were like, okay, they're with us. They, they're, they're excited to see the show and they can't wait. But then I would have my back to the audience and turn around and, and for the first time see them all. And that was the moment where, and I remember that from Young Frankenstein too. I had the same sort of thing my back to the audience. I turned around and that is a heart stopping moment to see that many people all going, what are you going to say next? <laughs> um, and, and it is that moment you, you, you get, you get nervous. And then after the first moment that someone responds, you know, there's a beautiful joke written in to the opening monologue. Um, and, and the minute I would say the punchline to that joke and the audience would laugh, you just go, oh, great. Then it's surfing. Then you just caught the wave and you can just surf the rest of the night. And it, it really, really wonderful. And of course, you know, without flattering them too much, the audiences in St. Louis are fantastic and they're really smart. You know, you, you, you fear sometimes that people aren't going to want to listen to a show that has fewer songs than most musicals and has that long 45 minute gap. But you could hear a pin drop or a child cough, one of the two. In that order. Um, this is a great question. Actually, someone is asking, and Adam, I'm going to have you take this. What was the most interesting fact you learned about U.S. history during the show? There it is. Mm. Any Hewitt. Anything? Mm. Now, while, while he's thinking, I want to share with everybody that Adam, I'm not going to say campaigned for the part, but he did <laughs> I, I if I can show everybody this, <laughs> we all received this text when we were casting, which was kind of brilliant. And we went, so, oh, here's our Ben Franklin. <laughs> so that's the handiwork of actor Reed Armstrong, who is an old, old dear friend of mine, who played Roger Sherman in our production of 1776. And when I heard that you guys were looking uh, for a Franklin, um, and Rob and I have done many shows together. I said, why not me? Uh, and he said, uh, well, I don't know. I think you're too young. I can't quite see it. Uh, I think he confirmed that you felt similarly and were ambivalent about the choice. So I, so sometimes, you know, we get into uh, sort of, we need to get that part head. Uh, it's a mentality and you figure uh, what what could make the case? And Reed, uh, uh, along with being a fantastic actor, is very gifted on the computer and can do all kinds of special effects with uh, Photoshop. And so I said, Reed, listen, I, this needs to happen quickly. Can you superimpose my face on the body of a stock image of uh, Franklin and he said, uh, yeah, let me work on it. And he got back to me 10 minutes later with that with that beautiful work. And I sent it right along to Rob who sent it along to you. And I think it made the case, you tell me. Oh, it totally did. Well, we didn't see you as portly for one thing. You're not, and you're not, you don't look, you know, so it was like, oh yeah, that's Franklin, let's go. <laughs> but wasn't it also those those hundred dollar bills that Adam superimposed himself on and sent to you guys as well? That helped? Do what you gotta do. Well, yes. I, not to me. I photographed these beautiful calves that I possess. And <laughs> That's right. Because I knew that they would be featured prominently as we all would be. The colonial fox. That's right. So Keith, you went from Jersey Boys to 1776. Yeah. <laughs> what was that like changing styles and completely different kind of show? Yeah, that's a wild, that was a wild transition for sure. Um, you know, actually, Jersey Boys, although I've done it for so long now, is a bigger step out of my wheelhouse. Uh, my degree is at, uh, in music from Oklahoma City University. So uh, this more traditional musical theater feels more like home. So to get to come back to the Muni and do something, sing in a style that felt more natural to me was really fun to flex some muscles that, uh, that felt good to, to flex in front of 10,000 loving St. Louis you know, theater patrons. It was nice. I, I have to say the rehearsal process was kind of, you know, we sort of had that joke about it was testosterone on parade, you know, <laughs> it just was like this frat house of a Broadway musical with uh, 
Jenny and Ali, who will be here later, sort of occasionally popping in for all of this. But, you know, I, I say that re respectfully and lovingly because part of the goal was to very quickly form a real sense of relationship between all these men. Like there had to be a real conflict and, and you really accomplished that. And I was just interesting, and, 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 and for any one of you, like what was that rehearsal process like? Because you so quickly with so many people had to figure out what your relationship was. Well, you guys I think are really great at bringing in amazing talent and good people. So it felt to me from the get go, um, I was, making new friends and, and creating new relationships off stage. And that for me is one of the most important elements in figuring out how to make relationships pop inside of a story. If we're getting on well off stage, it almost always in my experience shines through in the relationships on stage. You know, yeah. Rob also does something that I think most people are probably averse to when they consider what your schedule is which is essentially, you know, we get there 10 days before the first performance. But Rob factors in something uh, uh, that you wouldn't think you had time for, which is table work, which is when we all sit around a grand table and uh, read through the play for a couple of days, I think. Wasn't that right, fellas? We got a day. Just, just a single day? Yeah. yeah. Well, it, 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 I think it... It felt like three. Everybody on the same page, and I think it... Uh, <laughs> It's such a smart use of the time. Yeah. yeah, and Rob had some very, you know, very good, strong ideas. He was able to set us set us off very quickly, um, which is good. And for me, you know, because it is it's a, a lot to say, I came in memorized just because there's no way you can you can play and try to learn the role at the same time. And I think everyone, most people, uh, did that coming in, and it really helped because right off the bat, we were able to play with each other rather than again, you know, call for line or look at our scripts or, or that kind of a thing. Um, it doesn't eliminate the fact that once you're in performance, after only 10 days of rehearsal, there are still moments where a line disappears, mm -hmm. you go up, you whatever, and that's always what makes live theater so exciting. That moment where you see another actor's eyes go, I really don't know what to say next. <laughs> and everyone just gets alert and everyone jumps in and, and saves that moment. It's really fun. The other thing I, I just remembered uh, thanks to Tracy Utzmeyer and Tim McDonald, who are watching what was rare for the show. We actually had your entire set on the West platform. Mm. Yes. So yeah. you have that advantage of the Philadelphia Hall, physically everything, every chair move, which were there were a lot of, everything you knew, oh, this is it. I don't have to relearn it later during tech. So that helped. All yeah, right, level this conversation, the mastermind of the show, Director Rob Ruggiero and the choreographer Enrique Brown, are you there? And hey I, guys! Oh, I made Hello. a mistake. I have to acknowledge everyone's yelling at me. I forgot to mention the music director Jim Moore. So, oh, hi. hi Rob. Hi, hi everyone. Hi, uh, Rob. Hey. Rob, tell us where you are and how you are. Uh, I'm in West Hartford, Connecticut. Uh, you know, running Theater Works. Hartford here, and as you well know, kind of, kind of shifting the plan day by day, week by week. But uh, doing great, working hard, and uh, so awesome to be here with you all. I missed you. Yeah. Hi, Enrique. Where are you? Uh, I'm here in New York City. I'm in uh, Central Harlem, and uh, mm -hmm. like like Peckoff, we are in the epicenter of this whole thing and uh we just wrapped up our our school year at manhattan school of music and our seniors our first graduating seniors of the first four-year program at school of music just happened last friday wow. so we were going through online classes and and figuring that fiasco out um, yeah. all right rob tell us how you manage this masterpiece <laughs> all these geniuses well i mean it starts with you know an amazing cast and i i know you're like oh you say that but it's true like 90 percent of directing is casting and we were so blessed with with not only these gentlemen here but with an entire cast of amazing men and women um and it was my second time doing the show i had done it in 2007 but as you know, when you were talking about the season and we were talking, it was really important to me uh, 
I was very excited you were doing it and I made a case to let me direct it because that was very important to me to remind people of their patriotism and remind people of the birth of this nation. Ironically, here we are going through this, you know, crazy thing, but I just felt it was a time in our history to, for us to remember collectively how, how, how proud and how wonderful it is to be an American. Mm. So Enrique, I'm so sorry we cut the big tap number that you had hoped for. <laughs> I know, I know. It was all going to be on the tables. We have tons of levels. It was, it was exciting, exciting things we were, we were creating. But yeah. you know, you had a real challenge with this show because the, the movement had to be masculine and it had to be credible. It wasn't really choreography yet. It had to be musical. Tell, tell us how you came to your work. Um, yeah, I mean, it, it was a big stretch for me because being a dancer myself, you know, the, you know, the first time I got to work with Rob, actually, um, I was the associate choreographer in Oklahoma that we did, what, five years ago, I believe it was, five summers ago. And um, after working with Rob, because I also had to perform in the show, and I was watching Rob as a director, and I just thought, this guy knows his stuff. I really want to work with this guy. And I approached him, and when he said, he brought up 1776, I was like, oh, there's no dancing in that show. And I went, you know, this is a great challenge for me because again, me being as a dancer, it's a way for me to step back and stretch myself as a choreographer, knowing that it's movement based. Um, and and Rob was happy to, to, to lead me in that direction. And he gave me a lot of advice. He helped me structure a lot of the work that I did. And, um, and I think together we collaborated on it mostly than it just being just me choreographing, um, you know, the, um, the menuet. Um, so it, it was fantastic. It was a great experience. It was a, it's a great way to go back and, and be more of a director or a co-director instead of being really a choreographer in this process. And then these gentlemen and the cast were phenomenal to work with. I mean, they brought creativity to the table and, Together we all collaborated the work that we came up with with the movement. So it was it was something special for sure. It was interesting, Robert, when you talk about that opening turntable move, which was amazing, and every night it got applause. And yeah. what was interesting about that, it, it it's not like the audience hadn't seen turntable moves before, but it was that moment that represented something we all knew and connected to, and. What I found so remarkable about what you all accomplished communally was the audience just trusted wherever this thing went. Like they didn't know it. They really did not know the show. It hadn't been done in uni for like 20, 25 years or so. And also there were some elements of the history where you could tell they were like, oh, did not know that. You know, there was this sense of, of engagement that was unlike anything else that I've, you know, I've, for me, that's been a part of at the Muni. And I was just sort of, how did you guys get to trust the audience on this? It would terrify me. Well, I remember Mike talking to you after after doing Gypsy, right? We did, and the, the fact that they, your audience so amazingly stuck with the book scenes. And I remember like, you, said, you know, this is a play with music. We're out in the beautiful Muni vibe and, you know, your audience never ceases to amaze me because they really love a great story. These guys are great storytellers. They lived that story out. And what I love about 1776 is that you know how it's going to turn out, but you're on the edge of your seat. I, I, I don't know how they did it, and but the, it's an amazing piece of writing because we all know it's going to be okay, but yet, you know, we're there. But I remember we had a conversation. I was like, and I, by the way, I was teasing you a little bit. I think it's actually somewhere in the 35 to 40 range, that book scene, but it's a long book scene. And, and you, you know, everybody stays with it, it because it's riveting. And, and I just, yeah. I also distinctly remember that the, toward the end, you know, of course, when they're trying to get the, de the votes to sign, there really was that sense in the audience of everyone leaning forward in their seats. Will they get this done? We all know it got done, but there, it, everyone, you could just feel it. It was so phenomenal. The, the nights where the audience would erupt into applause once we had the votes, fantastic. Yeah. yeah, Peter Stone reminded us of this story, which we just kind of take as uh, received wisdom, but it, 
it is a hell of a suspenseful story, and he and he brought it to it. Uh, pretty great achievement. And a really powerful message, if I'm gonna jump on my time, is the notion that these people fought. They really, some of them hated each other. They had in incredibly different opinions about the way the country should be, but they all worked together ultimately to make this thing happen. And that was to me, especially for where our country feels like it is right now, that was what I kept going home with every night was the sense that here's a moment where everyone got to see, we don't all have to agree, but we do all have to get along. And that was phenomenal. And I think our production, re that really is what stuck with me about our production, about the compromise it takes to do something extraordinary. And, yeah. and it really reminded me that compromise is a powerful thing and a painful thing. Mm -hmm. yeah. uh, somebody's asked this question. Did anyone, this comes from Lori Burdack Miller. Did anyone in the cast ever look at the US flag on the side of the Muni stage and think, if it weren't for the events we're doing here, this flag would not be here? Wow. Yeah. I think. I think so. I think there are many a times we, we we talked about it, about the flag on the stage, actually, a couple times. I think it was even just the history lesson of going, why is it on on the one side of the stage versus the other side of the stage? It was like it was always referenced at some point in rehearsals or during tech or anything. Yeah. For sure. Yeah. Um, Robert Adam Keith. Did you feel any obligation in this? To, did you do any outside research outside of the, knowing the show? on these historical figures? Did you feel you, Did you feel the weight of that or did you just feel within the world of the show? You know, it's kind of yeah. like Adam was saying, uh, the book was written so well. Um, a lot of it was in there. You know, of course you want to do a little bit of uh, research and, and character development, but um, a lot of the work was already done and and to have that book and to have Rob as our director and um, there, was, there was a support system built into the experience I felt. Yeah. I had just finished narrating a book about John Adams and his son, John Quincy Adams, when, when the offer came in. I thought, oh, my God, this is amazing. So I had this, this wealth of knowledge. And then when I read the script for the first time, which because I wasn't that familiar with 1776, when I read the script for the first time, I thought, well, they really got it right. I mean, what this very scholarly, deeply researched book about the lives of, of John Adams and his son uh, – that, that was all on the pages of this script. So I was really pleasantly surprised and pleased. You've narrated some great books, Robert. I've been, I've been lucky. Yeah, and I, so which of- oh, uh, Robert. I was just curious what that, that book was that you narrated. Oh, you were gonna ask me that title. Um, <laughs> uh, I'm gonna have to look it up and get back to you. Uh, okay. it, was, it was historically <laughs> about, um, it was about the the notion of of um, the basic ideas behind the building of the country and how both John Adams and John Quincy had one idea about how dis destructive political parties were, among other things, uh, which seems to have borne out. And uh, and as opposed to you know the Federalists uh, uh, versus the uh, the others, so it it was a very good book. Oh, God, I wish I could remember the title now. Um, I will get it to you. Okay, can I just say, because, before we lose the opportunity, uh, Rob did a masterful job, I think, of collecting all of the best actors in St. Louis. Uh, and <laughs> I feel that, you know, Jock was there, and, uh, and you know, so many of the best. Uh, a real, you know, a real fraternity was created there. Patrick Blindauer just popped up and says, Marilyn says, hey. <laughs> <laughs> um, Patrick. Patrick, and I have to give, before I lose this opportunity, I have to say something because you know I've worked with Adam, I've worked with Keith before 1776, and from day one, Mike Isaacson said Petkoff is your John Adams, <laughs> and I didn't know you. I completely fell in love with you. I can't imagine you know anyone else doing that, but it, but Mike had the patience of my process and but he said from day one it's petkov it's okay. petkov and he was right so. well it's funny because it wasn't on my radar you know again i was i was not familiar with the show and I, I know when the offer came i said well let me let me take a look at the script and see what this role is and i think about a page and a half in i went what am i thinking say yes to this 
Don't be stupid. <laughs> and the book is and called thanks, The Problem Bill. of Democracy. What, what's the book called? The Problem of Democracy. Mm. Uh, yes. All right, Enrique and Rob, we're gonna say goodbye to you. We're gonna bring some of the ladies on. Any parting comments, any parting thoughts? Oh, I love you guys. It's so good to see you guys. And, and, and I'm sorry it's in this world. Hopefully, you know, we'll get to hug each other again and, and love each other yeah. soon. <laughs> so. Absolutely. And I'll just say uh, it's great to be here with all of you. I'm sorry we can't be here with everyone. So say hi to the ladies. And I look forward to the next bit of Muni Magic. Mm. I got uh, it. Bye, bye, bye Ricky. All right, let's welcome to the party our two leading ladies, Jenny Powers and Allie hey. Yeah, There they are. Hey. Hi, hi, Mommy. Hi. Oh. hi. It's so good to see you. Okay, let's start with you, Allie. Where are you? How are you? I'm doing well. I am at my parents' house where I grew up, my childhood home, in Pleasantville, New York, about 45 minutes north of uh, the city. And I have to say, just getting to be, because the um, the way this uh, platform works, it says we're backstage. So I very much felt like I was backstage watching, you know, the wonderful gentlemen do their work. Very excited to jump in and participate too. <laughs> nice to be backstage, right? Uh -huh. <laughs> and Jenny, where and how are you? I'm well, I am in Northeast Arkansas, in Jonesboro, Arkansas, um, where, there's a lot of natural social distancing that goes on here. <laughs> kind of built in. <laughs> now, someone tipped it earlier in the broadcast, whatever we're calling these, that uh, there was something very exciting going on with you during this production. And what has happened subsequently? <laughs> well, um, yes, I had a secret um, underneath my corset. <laughs> a really tight corset that got tighter. Every performance, um, we, well, not we, I gave birth to our very first little girl. Yay. Rose Eileen Cavanaugh, um, who it's, you know, for those of you who did know, and I think there was just a handful of you. Um, yeah. Yes, 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 yes. Uh, you know, I, I didn't find out the gender. Um, with this baby. And so it was a complete shock being in labor and delivery. I waited forever for this little girl to come down the birth canal. Someone said, up, oh, it's a girl, stubborn. She's taking her time, high maintenance. And I thought, oh, gosh, what am I in for? I'm used to the boys. Um, yeah. So we have this baby girl. And let me tell you guys, she is um, extraordinary. I mean, she's just, she's the light. Every day, I mean, you can imagine my house. I mean, I've had to be a pre-K four teacher, a first grade teacher. <laughs> I also taught a course at Arkansas State University this past semester. It was my first time wow. teaching at the collegiate level. So I was doing that on Zoom with like this circus act going on behind me. I can't say that we were the Ringling Brothers, more like Barnum and Bailey. <laughs> um, but yeah, she, oh my gosh, every time I would take a, a break and have to nurse her, you know, just looking at her, I'd think, okay, um, I can do this. You know, you're healthy, I'm healthy, the boys are healthy, and, uh, you know, you, you, you push forward, even in the midst of, of a lot of chaos. Um, so, yeah, I'm in Arkansas. We're a family of five now. Wow. Yeah, and everything is, is, is great for the most part, except I, I miss hugging people, I miss touching, I don't like wearing the masks. Yeah, it's really hard. All right, you two, what was it like being the only sorority sisters in the midst of that fraternity? <laughs> well, I have to say, so, because I came into the process a little late because, as you may recall, I was on stage for all of 10 minutes in 1776. And as soon as I got there, Jenny ran up to me and said, oh, thank goodness you're here. <laughs> I know. And I, I, think I, and I think I told you the secret right, right away. <laughs> you hugged closely. And I think I could tell by the look on your face like you felt a bump. You know? Because like I, I have something to tell you. I yeah. know. I know. I know. Um, no, it, listen, I, I like hanging with gentlemen. I, 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 I can, you know, I think Allie and I can hold our own with the boys. Oh, yeah. It yeah. was fine by me. 
Oh, we had a blast. It was awesome. <laughs> it really was. All right. Now I have a little sound clip I want to play here if I can find this. So everyone hit mute for a second. And here is uh, Ms. Powers and Mr. Petkoff going at it. Come soon as you can to my cloister. I've forgotten the feel of your hand. Madam, we shall walk in Cupid's Grove together and we'll fondly survey. Till then, till then, I am as I ever was and ever shall be. Yours, 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 yours. Saltpeter, John. Oh, amazing. Now, and out of context, the audience is like, Saltpeter, what? <laughs> but, I, I, you know, when you talk about Peter Stone's work, who wrote the book for 1776, you know, I mean, one of the gifts of, of this job is that you, I get to do all these shows and you get under the hood and you sort of see what's really going on. And I've really felt what's extraordinary in the writing is those, the relationships of the couples really grounded the show for the audience. Just when the ideas would get, I'm not gonna say overwhelming and too big, the human struggle of those ideas came out in those relationships, which you all did so beautifully Allie and Keith, yours was sort of running on a different energy. <laughs> yes, it was. And it reminds me of a funny story. Allie, you were talking about when you, you know, you were a little late to the party. Allie got to rehearsal right in time for us to block our first scene. And for those who don't remember what our first scene on stage was, it was about a 90 second kiss scene. Um, you know, which of course in the world of theater feels like a 12 minute kiss scene. We'd never met. Rob was like, Ali, Keith, Keith, Ali, go you may now kiss the bride. And I can just remember being, you made it so easy, uh, but I can just remember being so flush and so nervous. I was like, oh my God. And like, you know, yeah, the whole bit. Um, but it, it was, it was, a, it was a hell of an experience. It's hilarious what we do. I mean, and Keith was an amazing, wonderful partner and gentleman about it. But it is funny, especially because there were people standing around watching too. And I just <laughs> met about everybody. Thank goodness I had so many mutual friends with you ahead of time who were like, he's a great guy, he's a great guy, you can be fine. <laughs> but it is sort of like the funny thing about our job and the thing that's so weird now, right, is that we're so used to being so up close and personal with other people and to have that sort of put on pause is very strange right now. Yeah. yeah. And Jenny and Robert, you two knew each other. You'd worked together before this, right? What had you done together? Jenny, you're still on mute. Oh, you're, you're still muted, Jenny. Sorry about yeah. that. Um, we did Happiness together. Uh, Susan Stroman and John Weidman and uh, who else was involved? Oh gosh, Robert. Uh, uh, Grey Gardens, uh, um, Gardens, Scott, yeah. Scott, and Michael, yeah. Michael Corey. Yeah. Yes, 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 yes. Thank you. Um, and uh, yeah, we did happiness together. We never really had a scene together. Oh, or no, we, not just really. a little, just more, uh, but not anything primary. No, 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 no. it was more just you know we we hung out backstage almost. We're all just stuck on the train together, if you yeah. know the musical at all. <laughs> yes, we yeah we didn't we never had to sing together or. Although, no. listen, I mean, it was an interesting situation in 1776 for us. I mean, you and I, we were almost blocked to not even look at each other at times. Yeah. Yeah, that's the other thing. You have this, you know, intimate relationship where I don't think we looked at each other until one moment toward the very end of the play. We looked, you know, when when uh, she's giving John the advice, getting on with it. You know? But at, at all the music, we're, we're singing out, we're looking at each other in our heads because right. it's all letters that we're writing to each other. 
So it was a very unique, interesting thing. But that intimacy was right there from the get-go. I mean, I felt deeply connected to you. So Yeah. Well, it was sort of both of those relationships were sort of confessional. Yes. You know, and so you felt the show sort of break open in that we're all dealing with this, but here's the truth. Here's the truth of the pain of this struggle, the price we're all paying. And it, yeah. that's where you just felt it just go deeper and deeper and, and richer. And then you had Mr. Heller as, you know, Franklin, who was sort of the observer of all this, right? The audience knew to watch him because he was the first one who figured out what's really going on. And he always came up with the strategies, right? He's like, here's mm-hmm. what you do. You know, so you had these sort of, these, these home bases to go to, and then it would sort of s- scatter from there. It was incredible. The, the, the beauty of the book, as you pointed out, which is it, it, it's telling this grand historical story, and then they consistently come down to the human level over and over to, so that the audience can relate. Because no one wants a history lesson on stage. They want to see human beings relating to each other. And I think it's just a really brilliant musical. So one of the things that also happens uh, <clears throat> backstage at the Muni is there's a certain level of hijinks that I don't want to know about once the show gets <laughs> and, and some of these are maybe documented and sent out and stuff. So at the end of this broad, at the end of this, we're going to end this for everyone who's watching. When we finish the conversation, uh, Ali Ewalt made everyone be a part of something that is a great gift that you're going to see. So you're going to see every member of the cast of 1776, but I can't do it justice to explain it. So Ali, would you explain what you did? Well, actually, I have to give credit to Robert because it was his idea. But of course, you know, he was on stage the entire musical and I was not. So I had time to go around and bug every single cast member to um, do a, we did a little, you know, as if 1776 were the intro to a television show, um, like Bonanza or something, um, with the overture and um, and managed to get everybody in, you know, their backstage positions, um, <laughs> doing funny little things. Yeah. And that was, of course, not the only thing that I did backstage because I had Lots of fun. So I got to <laughs> open. Um, Jenny and I sang a beautiful duet, um, like the one you heard earlier. Props um, <laughs> to Alex Pracken, who was very game because he was backstage with me, and I stole him about every five seconds and said, "Alex, Alex, can we do this thing? Can we do this thing?" Mm-hmm. <laughs> Made everybody participate. But you know, it was it was certainly uh, entertaining for me, and it was such a great group of people that everyone was game to you know to yeah. play along and have some fun backstage. That's great. Amazing. And uh, that July 3rd performance? And <laughs> we'll talk about that. Man, I just remember for me, Gosh, yeah. my final performance of Young Frankenstein was rained out. Yeah, right. And when we came to the theater that night, I thought, not again. You know, I, you, you, you want it, you get so few performances of it. You, you really want to do every show, you know? And so we looked at the clouds with such trepidation. And what happened was there was a delay. We got the show in, but literally, I mean, it was a long show. We started at 15 and it came down at like 11, 10, 11, 15. And it was a long anniversary. Yeah, it was long. But the delay took the signing of the Declaration of Independence. We were all watching because we were trying to time it to end at midnight. And we got so close. <laughs> but it was like two minutes after or under, I can't remember. It was that was gonna, but the audience cheered because oh, they it was darn close. I mean, to me, it was right on, Mike. I mean, all right, we're gonna call it there. Yeah, yeah. and they stayed. That was the thing that like really just made my heart expand. Was that you know it was it was a late night for a lot of people, and so many people stayed. The vast majority stayed, and I thought that was really great. Yeah, that was very moving. I I I. Uh, I'll get too emotional. That audience is really dedicated to mm-hmm. being there, being a part of it, getting the experience. And they were into that show and knowing what that night was and what it meant, they were they were gonna be there. Um, okay, Robert, Adam, and Keith, I think we're gonna say goodbye to you. Any final comments? Anything you wanna say? Love the Muni, and I can't wait to be able to come back. Yeah. We must support this theater. Yeah, and we are waiting out for for sweeter times, but.
but there is nothing like it. Mm -hmm. And uh, 102 years, just remarkable achievement. Congratulations. Hope to see you again soon. Yeah, yeah. I count my lucky stars to be a part of this community, and I can't wait to uh, be lucky enough to stand on that stage again. Wishing you all the very best. Yeah. All right. Love you guys. Take care. It was so Bye. Good to see you. Bye. Bye, ladies. All right. We are going to now bring in Alex Kraken, Michael James Reed, and Ben Davis. Yeah. Yes. Hey. All right. Hi, everyone. Oh, okay. All right. Let's start with you, Ben. Where are you? How are you? I'm in lower Manhattan still. I'm doing great. The weather is finally starting to look up, so that makes life a lot better here. Good. Michael? Hey. Uh, I am just down the road from you. I'm in my new home in University City, just outside of St. Louis. Fantastic. And Alex, where are you? I'm up here in Manhattan, somewhere in the awkward part between Harlem and Upper West Side, but <laughs> safe and happy. Everyone's good. That's great. All right. So each of you, you have to lay out your... I, I'll start with my memory of Alex Bracken. Which, oh, God. <laughs> It was just awesome because, you know, your part was the, the character sort of walked on, walked on, blah, 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 blah. But, and then delivered that unbelievably beautiful, powerful ballad that ended the first act. And I just remember during the rehearsal period, you were always there and you had the satchel. And no, you were, you were what? You were completely dedicated to the mood of that show and being there. And like every time you walked on stage, it had meaning and gravitas. You like, it was so, it was just, I just admired it so much. So I'm sorry. But anyway, what's your memory, Alex? <laughs> I mean, it was, uh, to, to your point, Mike, the show is, you know, whether whether we're running the show, like like those three guys, boys who were on it earlier or were coming in and out like me and the ladies were, it's very much an ensemble piece. It's about the entire community of early America creating this declaration. So even, you know, my role, which I think I timed has seven or eight minutes of stage time, seven lines in one song. Um, you know, he's part of the fabric of the country and he represents a part of the, an entire population of the country that otherwise doesn't get a voice in the show, you know, because it's mostly people in the Congress and he represents, you know, the people who are on the battleground and the people who are doing the physical labor and the war and the fighting. Um, so I wanted to really give those people, those underdogs, those those people, the voice that they deserved and portray like, while all these people are here making these laws, there are a lot of people suffering at the same time. Uh, it was a really special, special piece to be a part of. Mm. Michael, your character had a lot of frustration. <laughs> no. Well, there were a lot of flies. There were a lot of flies. <laughs> there were a lot of flies. <laughs> What's your memory of this? Oh God, it's so good to see, uh, to, it was, to listen to everyone earlier and to just be reminded of what uh, just a wonderful experience this was and what a unique Muni experience and theatrical experience it was for me um, in so many ways. Um, I Someone mentioned it earlier and one of my one of my favorite things that would happen every night is the cast would slowly assemble. The set was all turned facing upstage and the cast at about five minutes would slowly assemble one by one um, in our great costumes um, and in character in a weird way, because we would greet Jop and we'd greet Petkoff and we would see Ben and we would all have these moments of just kind of just the Continental Congress meeting, uh, sitting upstage with 10,000 people on the other side of the scrim. Um, and it was this great moment of just of of uh, of all of us all being together um, before we were about to launch into this three hour evening of theater, um, and I, I just loved that. And then we would all sing the national anthem, and then we would get on with the play, and it was just wonderful. Ben, how about you? Uh, you know, when I when I knew I was going to be doing the show, everybody that that I had ever talked to about this show, and I really didn't know it that well. But everybody that had done it always talks about how it was such a special experience for them. And uh, so then to be a part of it and actually feel that uh, was was really special. You know, it was just a great ensemble of people. The guys was it's such a fantastic like um, energy that comes together. And then you add Ali and you add Jenny in there, too. 
who helped to lighten and brighten the whole thing and, and make us smell better. And, um, <laughs> and so it was just, it just became a, 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 everything that everybody had always said about 1776. And then you throw that into the Muni's environment, which is always very special and very uh, bonding. And it just made for an amazing experience. And to do it in front of 10,000 people and to feel there's that moment at the end of the show where Georgia Boot is, is, is the one making the decision basically if this is going to happen or not. And there was always a palpable, uh, it's, it's credit to his acting, it's credit to the direction, it's credit to the scene, it's, it, to everything. Uh, there was always a palpable breath in the audience and on stage uh, that just made it incredibly gratifying every night. Um, it, it's interesting that the other thing that was um, important to me uh, because last season was the first season with the new stage, right? Mm -hmm. So we were experimenting and flowing, but this show stripped it all back down again. Mm. I mean, we turned the turntable and basically did the LEDs where we really held back except for uh, Bobby's number, Petkoff with the fireworks, and then the signing. And it just showed the pure power of the stage. Like just, this, this is all we needed. We needed these great actors, this great story, one set and go. And it was just fascinating because everything before that had been in this, this new sense of vibrancy. And then we just went to this place of just simple power and truth and we were all just but so. You know, what, I, what I always wonder about is how you guys and you, you locals can speak to this. Um, now I don't think every city in America could maintain that level of focus and uh, throughout some of those scenes. So something in St. Louis, whether it be the Muni, whether it be at the theaters uh, in there, but anyways, there's a culture of theater going in, in St. Louis that always has struck me every time I've been there. And I'd like to chalk it up to these people you see on the screen, but I think it also has to do with just uh, the people of St. Louis. And so what is it? What is it about that? I mean, I, I felt it from the first time I, you know, I moved to St. Louis 10 years ago and I think I've done over 10 shows here now. And um, it's so unique in the fact that that audience and, and, and I, people who have been long time know this, but I think we all have to experience it because we feel it exactly what you're saying, Ben, is that uh, it's more than just 10,000 people in the audience. It's 10,000 people who, who own that theater, mm -hmm. who, who have a sense of ownership. And who literally are as 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 a, you know it's it's the municipal theater of St. Louis, and so they when they see these shows they have this ownership group, this investment that you can really only have through ownership, mm, mm. and it is extraordinary. I, I feel it in every show I do, but when with this show in particular, to have forty five minutes of talking without a song or dance, and to have them listen in the way they did, I. I'll always remember that. Um, and I'll always remember <laughs> getting through to the end of that scene and still being alive. <laughs> and thanking God that we made it. <laughs> I mean, Alex has a particular history because you were a Muni kid. Sure. Teen, so. Yeah, I mean, growing up in St. Louis and seeing all these Muni shows, there's definitely a appreciation for the art of musical theater and what creates a good musical because of the history that the Muni uh, creates in the atmosphere of St. Louis, not just for being there for many, many years, but also growing up watching all these classic musicals that to me, like growing up, I was like, oh yeah, Hello Dolly, like My Fair Lady, Gypsy. And you know, we, when I got to college, people were like, what are those shows? And I'm like, you didn't see those in, in your town? <laughs> um, but I, but it, just, it just shows like how much growing up in such a like flourishing theater community that at the heart of it is the Muni, how important and how people, how the theater culture revolves around this theater that, you know, really allows pieces to, despite, you know, this ginormous theater allows the pieces to work on the merit of their book and their music and whatnot. And learning and growing up in that atmosphere has made me appreciate the art form so much more. Uh, Jim Hook, has, uh, he's, his comment is, Miss Ewalt has the voice of an angel. 
uh, which makes sense because you played Christine on Broadway for a year. Angel of Music. <laughs> which actually tips another listening party here. So we're going to hear a little bit of Ali. Everyone put your microphone on mute for a second. <laughs> and hopefully I'm going to hit the right button. Loving pride, loving pride, loving life, for it was high, 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 There it is. Yay. I love that you all got to watch me listen to that for the first time. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Jim. What's funny is part of why I was giggling that whole time was because, um, you know, we had just done this dance that Enrique had choreographed. Um, and I was wearing a giant, gorgeous, gorgeous dress, but that was, you know, corseted with like a full hip bustle. And um, and right before I sang that key change, um, Adam and Robert had to lift me up. I had to jump up onto this bench. And the first time we did it, and probably every night um, after that, because we didn't really have time to rehearse because of the way the meeting was, I was convinced that I was going to die. I was convinced that I had no air left in my lungs. <laughs> And so it was like one of those magical, I think it's like that that meanie magic moment. And I was like, I'm just gonna try and hopefully I'll get through it. And thankfully I didn't actually die. What I remember was you during tech, because it was our first year with the automation. So we were so scared and so conservative. And you rode out on that, it was like a stairs and a platform, right? And Tracy was like, okay, Ali, we're gonna put, you're gonna ride on the, are you okay, Ali? Okay, we're gonna hit the button. And you like, that thing was like. <laughs> and, and you're looking at me like, are, are we serious? Really? <laughs> I, I'm good, I'm, this is safe, I'm good. And at the spot, we're like, are you okay? Are you okay? And you're like, yeah, I'm fine. <laughs> I, I do have, um, so this was 1776 was my third show at the Muni. First was West Side, then Forum. Um, and this was my third balcony. So I've decided that, you know, <laughs> if I have the fortune of performing at the Muni again, I was part of my third balcony. <laughs> hey, Jenny, was your first Muni show like right out of college? Were you at, didn't you do Oliver like you had just graduated or something? Is that right? Uh, it was maybe a year later. It was right after Little Women. Is that about four years ago, Jenny? Yeah, yeah thank you. I was I was in that production of Oliver, believe it or not. <laughs> yes, you did wrong. I was. <laughs> yeah. Was that in 2006? Five or six? Uh, yeah, six, seven, somewhere around there. Yes. Yes. That's my so first funny. mini show was Nancy and Oliver. Um, that was my first time experiencing the magic. And it, and it's it's such it's, it's such an incredible stage, isn't it, you guys? I mean there's there really is, I know where a lot of people are saying this, but there is nothing like performing under those stars and moon um, and just feeling the love of the St. Louis community. And I was hooked after that show. I was like, all right, anytime you want me, I'm in. <laughs> and I think actually, Ben, to your question about like, there, there are often times where I go, this shouldn't be working when it's completely working. Yeah. And, I think it's a combination of a right. I mean, I mean, this sounds so treacly, but there's an element of mystery to the whole thing that I've learned to only look so deep and then just let it be. Yeah. So there's certain things in rehearsal or something where I can tell people are naturally nervous or like, is this going to work? Or I'm just like, I don't know why, but this is going to work. And, and particularly I know a lot of, you know, people were like, wow, 35, you know, minute book scene. Let's, let's see how this does it never, never, never worried me for a second. Yeah. No, you know, it's, and I think, I think Jenny sort of tipped it. There's something to the outdoors. I think there's something to starting in the sun and descending together. 
I also think, you know, you've probably never experienced it, but the physical space as you go back in the theater, it's this incredible magnifying glass that pulls everybody into the action as well as sort of who they are. It's, uh, you know, I, I can sort of see the symptoms, but I, I don't know what it is, but that's okay. <laughs> we'll, we'll just let it be. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. All right. Well, you are all amazing. And I'm so grateful you gave us this time. And I'm not going to get misty eyed, but my heart is really full talking to you and remembering the show. And I'm so happy you're safe and healthy. And we will all be together again and we'll be able to hug. And that's going to happen. And we're going to do that. Right. <laughs> it's so, so good to see everybody. All right. Yeah. Well, I'm gonna say good night now, and we're gonna we're gonna head off with Albert Ewald and Robert Petkoff, genius creation yes. of the cast of 1776 <laughs> in their 70s. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Joe Hartman. Thank you, Michael Baxter, for getting this so beautifully organized. Yeah. Take us, Joe.